Yeah. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Lincoln. Dr. Lincoln is sort of, uh, you know, he's a hero in many ways. First of all, he's been um, at probably every big, uh, been involved with every big uh, particle physics um, discovery in the last couple of years. He was a co-discoverer co of the top. He was in on uh, the Higgs with CMS, right? He's also a great guy for outreach. He's got two books for the general public. And I understand he's got a third one coming up on astrobiology, and that's going to be out in a, in a couple of weeks. Is that right? Like now. But, but now. So look in Barnes & Noble for the uh, book on astrobiology. So please, let's welcome Don Lincoln. All right, thanks, Tom. All right, so first, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. yeah? Okay. All right, so uh, as Tom said, my name is Don Lincoln. I'm a physicist at Fermilab. I split my research time between Fermilab and CERN. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the buzz associated with the Higgs boson. Uh, this was a big particle discovery back uh, in July of 2012, so uh, whatever that's 15 months ago. And I'm going to bring you up to date and let you know everything I know about that discovery. So I'm going to tell you about hunting for the Higgs boson. But before that, you need to have some background, some information that kind of gets you in the right mindset of what we're talking about. So we start out with looking at the universe. We all do this. We look around us. And the universe is full of a tremendous amount of beauty, whether it be a beautiful flower, a sunrise, galaxy, whatever. However, there are different degrees of beauty. There's the aesthetic beauty that we have in art, but there's also a scientific beauty. Now, all of these things are quite different. A human being has a very different living process than a flower. How the waves work is different than how the sun burns. What holds the galaxy together? All of these things seem to be utterly unrelated phenomena. And yet, everything you see there can be built out of a few small subatomic particles, specifically these ones that are circled here. I'll talk more about them in a moment, but these pink things are called quarks. So if you take an up and a down quark, you can make protons and neutrons. If you make protons and neutrons, add an electron, you can make atoms. If these particles have to do with how the atoms are held together. If you take those things, you can make everything in the universe you've ever seen, everything you see here. And that is its own beauty, a mathematical beauty, a simplistic beauty. The fact that all of the complexity you see here is really incredibly simple. There are a few rules that make up the universe. So now, many people don't have a good sense of scale of what it is that we study. So this is sort of a, uh, the various stages of matter, um, starting from the very small going to what we study nowadays. The smallest living thing uh, that exists is a virus. Now my wife, she's a biology teacher, and she tells me correctly that uh, Don, viruses aren't really alive, but well, she's not here. So <laughs> the smallest living thing is a virus. And a virus is 10 to the minus 7, 1 10 millionth of a meter. So you know how long a meter stick is? It's about yay big. The smallest line on a meter stick is a millimeter, and you can take 10,000 viruses side by side inside a millimeter. And that's how small it is. Now that's really small, but on the scale of the things that we study nowadays at places like Fermilab, this is huge. Viruses are made of molecules. Molecules are about one one hundredth the size of the virus. Um, molecules are, of course, are made of atoms. Atoms are about one tenth the size of molecules. You see this picture of an atom with a small nucleus, and electrons swirling around the side of it. The nucleus of the atom is ten to the minus fourteenth meters, which is one hundred trillionth of a meter. A nucleus is as small compared to a virus as a virus is compared to you. And yet, this thing, as small as it is, it's like so 1930s. I mean, we, we did this a long time ago. 80 years ago, we understood this. Nuclei are made of protons and neutrons. They're about one-tenth the size of a nucleus. Now, inside protons and neutrons are things called quarks. You can't see back there, but there's a little less than sign. The size of a quark is less than 10 to the minus 18th meters. So why do I say less than and not a specific size? The reason is we don't know what the size it is. But what we do know is how good our equipment is. Suppose you wanted to look at something like talc. So you take baby powder and you put it on your hand. You might possibly be able to see the smallest bit of talc with a magnifying glass. But if you looked at talc and you couldn't see its size, 
you wouldn't conclude that there was no smallest piece of talc. What would you conclude is how big it was. It was smaller than you could see with a magnifying glass. Well, the current magnifying, magnifying glass we use now is a large particle accelerator in Europe. And it can see things that are as small as 10 to the minus 18 meters, actually 10 to the minus 19. This number changed just recently. So one ten thousandth the size of a proton. So we've looked for quarks many times, and we know they exist, we can see them, but we've looked for their size, and we've never seen that they have a size. So we can conclude if they have a size, it's smaller than 10,000 times smaller than a proton. And hence, that's the less than sign. Quarks are very well established from 1975 or so, we know they're true. And so this is particle physics now. What is the smallest, the next layer in this cosmic subatomic onion? The answer is I don't know. So that's what we study. We study these little bits of matter. We also study the laws that hold them together, the sort of fundamental aspects of nature, the things that hold all of these pieces together. What makes a nucleus look like a bunch of frog eggs and an atom look like a planetary system? Why? These are the sorts of things that we study. In addition, we investigate the universe as it existed right after the Big Bang. The universe began in the cataclysmic explosion 13.8 billion, with a B, years ago. But we can recreate the conditions of the universe a trillionth with a T of a second after the Big Bang. That's the temperatures that we routinely study. And so that's kind of cool. And as I say, it allows us to study temperatures that haven't existed commonly in the universe since the very, very moment of creation. So, you know, you're here at uh, college, and some of you are taking chemistry. I want to draw your attention to something that you know something about. The periodic table was invented in the 1860s. And so you probably remember that each individual column is something that is similar. For instance, you know, here you have uh, helium, neon, argon, and so forth. These are the Nobel gases. And so within a column, these elements have chemically similar properties. Over here, you've got hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so forth. These are highly reactive chemicals. These are non-reactive chemicals, and each column has a commonality. Now, long before we knew anything about atoms, we knew, we saw this structure, that there were things that were heavier, but had similar chemical features. And we now understand where that comes from. The heaviness comes from additional protons and neutrons, and the common chemical features has to do with how atoms are, are formed, how the electrons work around them. So, this was an amazing thing that we had 100 elements, with 100 elements you could explain all of the chemistry, all of living things, everything you could see in the universe. That was an improvement. But at the turn of the last century, we began to realize that atoms had a structure. They had a, a center structure, the nucleus, the ad electrons flying around it. And here I have the, uh, it's intended to be the helium and neon has the same structure on the outside. But here was an amazing improvement. We now then knew that atoms, of which there are 100, could re recreate everything that we see, but atoms could be made of three things, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And that was a tremendously amazing simplification. However, physicists are not known for leaving well enough alone, and so we continue to study and look at things. And we now know that the proton and the neutron themselves have things inside them. These things are called quarks. So I showed you this picture a moment ago. There are six types of quarks. They're called up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom. Up, down, and strange we knew about before we even knew the quarks existed. The quarks were the invented, postulated, the first idea of quarks was 1964. Charm quark was discovered simultaneously in California and Long Island, New York, in 1974. Bottom quark was discovered at Fermilab in 1977 by Leon Letterman, who became, well, he led the group, who, and Leon eventually went on to become Fermilab's director. The top quark was discovered also at Fermilab in 1995 by, well, me. Uh, well, actually, it's me and 600 of my, or 800 of my closest personal friends, but you know, <laughs> I'm taking credit today. Uh, top quark was discovered. These two were discovered at Fermilab. There are also particles called leptons. The electron is the most familiar one, but there's also a thing called a muon and a tau. There are also particles called neutrinos, which are incredibly interesting, and I don't have time to talk about today, but I'll sort of gloss those over. What you see here is kind of interesting because the charge of an up quark is two thirds the charge of a proton. The down quark is minus one-third the charge of a proton. And that is similar. The charm quark has a, a charge like an up quark, and the top quark has a charge like a charm quark, has a charge like an up quark. But as you go across, these get heavier. So these might call, think of them as being chemically similar, 
but heavier as they go across. Same thing. Dial and strange bottom, all the same charge, but heavier. Electron muon tau, same charge, but heavier. Now you might ask yourself, why do we have this repeating properties? After all, we see here in my little picture that a proton can be made of two up quarks and a down quark. A neutron can be made of an up and two down quarks. So you only need this first column. So why are there two additional columns? And the answer is, I don't have a clue. In fact, a Nobel physicist named I.I. Rabi back in the 30s, when the first of this second column was found, this muon, um, when he, someone said that he found it, he said, like, who ordered that? Who has that all about? <laughs> we don't know why there are additional columns. But now, now what I'm telling you now is just my personal opinion. It's my gut call. I could be wrong. But the fact that we have these similar things with increasing mass, that's very much like what we saw back in 1860, where we had similar things with increasing mass. My own personal opinion is I think that there's probably something inside these quarks. I don't know that. It could be wrong. You should not believe it. But it's what my gut tells me, and that's what I spend my time looking for, trying to find what is the next thing, the smallest thing that makes up these guys. So that is kind of a whirlwind through particle physics. Now let me tell you a little bit about this whole Higgs thing and, and where it was discovered and so forth. So the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, is a large particle accelerator outside Geneva, Switzerland. Um, here's a picture of it. It's 18 miles around. You can see right here, this is Lake Le Mans. Here is Geneva, Switzerland itself. The Rhone River, which you can barely see, crosses the French countryside. This is an international airport. Gives you a sense of scale. This ring here is about the same size as the Fermilab rings. So if you've ever gone there and gone up in the high rise, that's what that looks like. And here's the LHC swooping across the countryside. This is a picture of what the LHC looks like. The size of the tunnel is taller than I can reach, but not much. It's like, well, it's lower than this uh, uh, ceiling here. And this is what the LHC looks like. Here's a picture of it, of course, morphing into an engineering display. It gives you a sense of what the LHC looks like. Now. Here is another photograph of it to give you more sense of scale. Here's uh, Europe. There's the LHC. And no, that's not how big it is, although I occasionally get that question. Um, here is France. Here is Switzerland. Um, CERN is actually right there at the very tip of that. So again, you can see Lake Le Mans here, the Rhone River, the LHC. Here is this little yellow triangle is when you go to the CERN laboratory. That's where you stay. Here is the airport. Right there is the Chocolaterie du Mont Blanc, which is the finest chocolate shop in all of the world. But if you go there, bring a lot of money. It's like 60 bucks a pound. It's amazing chocolate, though. Uh, in fact, it's almost worth going to CERN just to get the chocolate. Um, this is what the LHC looks like. Now, this is a misleading picture because this is 18 miles around, but each one of the detectors is only about 300 feet underground. So the aspect ratio is entirely wrong. There are four experiments, ATLAS, CMS, LHCB, and ELISE. They're arrayed around the ring. And that's kind of what it looks like. And here, you see the Swiss-French border. And you can't see it at all, but it crosses a couple of times. The LHC is mostly in France. So I talked about the four experiments. Here they are. Now I'm going to talk about two of them very briefly, because they did not have any role in the Higgs. Uh, but they are interesting physics. So, this particular experiment is intending to study a very interesting thing. You guys have all heard E equals mc squared. And you might even know something about it that says that energy equals mass and mass equals energy. And people might have told you that energy can be converted into mass and mass can be converted into energy. And that's true to a degree. But normally when you convert energy into mass, you make matter and a substance called antimatter at the same time. Matter and antimatter are kind of like the positive and negative of matter. And this is just true. We can do this all the time. There's nothing bizarre about this. We've known about this for pushing 100 years. Matter and antimatter are made in equal quantity. Now, when the universe was smaller, it was hotter. There was energy everywhere. And when the, energy, uh, the universe cooled, this energy converted into matter and antimatter. But I'm made of matter. You're made of matter. The Earth is made of matter. The solar system is made of matter. Every galaxy we can see up as far as we can see is made of matter. And I just told you that matter and antimatter are made in equal quantities. So where did the antimatter go? The answer is, I don't know. We have some ideas, but we really don't know the answer to that. And one of the things that's both exhilarating and a little bit confusing, when you work 
like I do, is you run into I don't know a lot. I don't know why the universe is made of entirely matter. There are some ideas. This experiment here called LHCB, and that's the LHC experiment to study B quarks, is tasked to understand why the antimatter disappeared. Uh, and to give you a sense of scale, this is about 60 feet long. So this is about as long as a house. Here, the Alice or Elise experiment, depending on what country you come from, that experiment is kind of cool. In that experiment, we take lead. Lead has 82 protons. There's 208 protons and neutrons. And you, um, what we do is we rip all the electrons off. So it's a bare nucleus of lead. We take two of them. We smash them together at nearly the speed of light. And at those temperatures, we make matter that is so hot that the protons and neutrons themselves melt. Just like taking ice cubes and putting them in a cup and putting a blowtorch to them. It melts into water. The protons and neutrons melt. The quarks inside them run around and scurrying everywhere. This stuff is called quark gluon plasma. It's true. We've seen it. We don't understand it very well. And this experiment is designed to study that melting process of protons and neutrons. And here is a person to give you a side sense of scale. So it's a really big thing. Now, the two biggies on uh, the uh, LHC are called CMS, the Compact Muon Solenoid, which I'm on. And compact is, after all, a relative term. It is 50 feet high, 50 feet long, uh, wide, 80 feet long. It weighs 14,000 tons. It has 100 million individual pixels in it. It's basically a 100 megapixel camera, but it's a 100 megapixel camera that can take 40 million pictures a second. And to give you a sense of scale, there are the people here. The beam will enter here and here and collide right there in the middle of the detector and will record the debris of the collision. Now the biggest, but not the heaviest of the experiments is this one here called Atlas. It's for a toroidal LHC um, apparatus, but Atlas is a lot easier to, to say. This particular experiment is 140 feet long, 70 feet wide, 70 feet high. It only weighs about 9,000 tons. But to give a sense of scale, if you took four of these, it would completely cover soldier fields with just enough room left over on the side for some cheerleaders and a water boy. This thing is really big. However, it's more mass than this guy. In fact, if you wrapped it in saran wrap or something, the density doesn't matter. It would, in principle, float. Here you a get sense of how big it is. Here's a person, there's a person, there's a couple of people up there. These are really big experiments. Now these two detectors are competitors. They are both trying to answer the same question, and the differences you see between the two detectors reflect the scientists' best guess at what technology will make a better or worse decision. Now here are some pictures of this. This is the CMS experiment. Um, I told you the sizes before. These white dots here are hard hats of people. The beam will enter here and collide in the center of the detector. I don't have a person on this one, but the Atlas experiment, remember, is huge. It is 70 feet high and 140 feet long. And these are magnets that make the thing all work. It's absolutely enormous detectors. Now, just to convince you that I didn't just pull these off the internet and know, you know, make this all up, I was there. So here's CMS, and there I am. And so now I'm not a fraud. OK, so let me tell you now, we're going to move into the Higgs boson, the Higgs field, and so forth. So I told you about the quarks and the leptons, and I didn't tell you much about it, but there are four forces. If you take <coughs> the three of the forces, the force that holds the nucleus together, called the strong force, the force that holds the atom together, called the electromagnetic force, and the force that causes some kind of radioactivity, called the weak force, plus those quarks and leptons, Put that all together, and that's called the standard model. And the standard model works. It explains very well most everything we see. It's the best fundamental theory we have. Now, there is a problem with it. And the problem is that in the simplest form of this standard model, all of these quarks and leptons should have zero mass. But they obviously don't. The top quark, which we discovered, has a mass over 170 times the mass of a proton, so they have mass. So either something's wrong. If this says that everything is massless and it's not massless, this, there's something wrong with the theory. Either we have to scrap the theory or we have to add something to the theory to save it. So this brings us to this chap. In 1964, Peter Higgs, who didn't look like that at the time, he was a young man, this is more, a more recent picture, 
he, along with five other people, postulated a energy field in the universe, a physics mechanism that gives particles their mass. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that works in a moment. So the mechanism is, is of a field which permeates all the universe. If the postulate is correct, and until recently that was that is a big if here, then one of the consequences of that is a particle called the Higgs boson. Now I have a little dinky sort of semi-animation to give you an idea how it works. Suppose this energy field, this Higgs field, didn't exist. Then a photon, which is a massless particle, can pick any particle you'd care to pick, uh, an electron or some quark. They both have zero mass, and so they have a balance. They, they weigh the same because, well, it's zero. But once you turn on the Higgs field, once the energy field becomes there, and that happens when the universe cools enough, what happens is that field gives mass to this particle, and it becomes heavy, and that one is still light. And that's the gist of how it works. So this is 1964. We are, after all, talking 50 years ago. He proposed this. There was this particle called the Higgs boson. So this Higgs boson idea is really kind of tricky. It's a very complicated idea. It's got yucky math. You look at some of it here, and it even looks daunting right there. However, it turns out there are some analogies that you can give that will explain how this works. Now, I thought I would do it up here and waving my hands, but it occurred to me it would be easier and maybe better if I could just go down the internet and find something for it. So what I did is I went out and I found an animation on the internet that really explains the Higgs field and Higgs boson in great detail. So this is the animation, so you won't see it did it, but you'll recognize the voice. This guy really knows this stuff, so you should pay attention to it. Without a doubt, the most exciting scientific observation of 2012 was the discovery of a new particle at the CERN laboratory that could be the Higgs boson, a particle named after physicist Peter Higgs. The Higgs field is thought to give mass to fundamental subatomic particles like the quarks and leptons that make up ordinary matter. The Higgs bosons are wiggles in the field, like the bump you see when you twitch a rope. But how does this field give mass to particles? If this sounds confusing to you, you're not alone. In 1993, the British science minister challenged physicists to invent a simple way to understand all this Higgs stuff. The prize was a bottle of quality champagne. The winning explanation went something like this. Suppose there is a large cocktail party at the CERN laboratory filled with particle physics researchers. This crowd of physicists represents the Higgs field. If a tax collector entered the party, nobody would want to talk to them, and they could very easily cross the room to get to the bar. The tax collector wouldn't interact with the crowd in much the same way that some particles don't interact with the Higgs field. The particles that don't interact, like photons for example, are called massless. Now suppose that Peter Higgs entered the same room, perhaps in search of a pint. In this case, the physicist will immediately crowd around Higgs to discuss with him their efforts to measure the properties of his namesake boson. Because he interacts strongly with the crowd, Higgs will move slowly across the room. Continuing our analogy, Higgs has become a massive particle through his interactions with the field. So, if that's the Higgs field, how does the Higgs boson fit into all of this? Let's pretend our crowd of partygoers is uniformly spread across the room. Now suppose someone pops their head in the door to report a rumor of a discovery at some distant rival laboratory. People near the door will hear the rumor, but people far away won't, so they'll move closer to the door to ask. This will create a clump in the crowd. As people have heard the rumor, they will return to their original positions to discuss its implications. But people further away will then ask what's going on. The result will be a clump in the crowd that moves across the room. This clump is analogous to the Higgs boson. It is important to remember that it is not that massive particles interact more with the Higgs field. In our analogy of the party, all particles are equal until they enter the room. Both Peter Higgs and the tax collector have zero mass. It is the interaction with the crowd that causes them to gain mass. I'll say that again. Mass comes from interactions with the field. So let's recap. A particle gets more or less mass depending on how it interacts with the field, just like different people will move through the crowd at different speeds depending on their popularity. And the Higgs boson is just a clump in the field like a rumor crossing the room. Of course, this analogy is just that, an analogy. But it's the best analogy anyone has come up with so far. So that's it. That's what the Higgs field and Higgs boson is all about. Continuing research will tell us if we found it, and the reward will probably be more than just a bottle of champagne. All right, so this animation I made with the Ted Ed people, 
and uh, it was very nice. I, I think they did a good job. Um, I have a series of uh, animations if you're interested, as well as um, videos where I'm talking on screen. And if you care, um, it's at drdonlincoln.com. And then in the left-hand side, there's a thing that says videos, and you can click to it, and it'll show you these. All right, so that tells you pretty much what the Higgs field and Higgs boson is, and that completes the standard model. We have the quarks, we have the leptons, we have these force-carrying particles, and we have this ghostly Higgs field where we find the Higgs boson to show that it's true. And it, we needed to find the Higgs boson to finish our understanding of the standard model. And so, to do that, we had to, before that we found the Higgs field, we didn't know what it was. We didn't know what the Higgs particle was. But what we did know is there were predictions. And the predictions told us that if we, depending on the mass of the Higgs boson, whether we found it, there would be all this stuff. So this is the Higgs mass. These are what we call the branching ratios. These are the fractions of when it, you know, they would decay into these things. And, oh man, I, I can tell you, I, I, I see I've lost some of you. In fact, I see a guy back up there. He's texting something. Oh my god. All right, it turns out it's not as bad as that. That looked all complicated, but we can actually get it, show it this way. It's a lot easier. All right, now here's the thing. There are two kinds of discoveries in science. The first kind of discovery in science is when you're walking along minding your own business and you go, holy cow, there's a leprechaun. That is a discovery, something you totally didn't expect. This is not the type of discovery that the Higgs field was. The Higgs field was predicted in 1964. Peter Higgs and his guys said, okay, if it exists, it will have this property and this property and this property, da, da, da. There was a lake of laundry list, and we had to go see if these were true. If you had a particle which had a mass of 125 GeV, don't worry about a GeV is, that means like 125 times the mass of a proton. If you had such a particle, and that's what we think we found, this is the various decay ways in which it will decay. It will decay 60% of the time into these bottom quarks, 20% of the time into W particles, 10% of the time into these things called gluons, and so forth. So obviously, this is where you would look. This is where most of the signal is. This is where it decays most of the time. So you should look for that and that. Makes sense. Except, of course, that's not what we did. In fact, what we did is we looked for these guys. So you could say, why would you do something so utterly stupid as that? I mean, this is 4% of the time. Making Higgs bosons was very hard. Why would you want to look at thing, the 4% of the decays? And the reason is the following. There are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ways to make two bottom quarks. And so to find a bottom quark and say that was bottom quark from a Higgs is really hard. Making two Z particles is very hard. And so if you see two Z particles, you have a much better fighting chance of saying that was two Z particles from a Higgs as opposed to two Z particles from something else. And the other, I'll talk about in just a moment. This one turns out to be the best way. In fact, it is this way. The Higgs boson can decay into two photons. Photons are particles of light. These are highly energetic photons, but they're basically just particles of light. This happens 0.2% of the time. And so here is an event display. This is from uh, one of the detectors. Turns out it's CMS. The beam would enter here and enter here. You see this has sort of a a soup can shape, so this is the barrel of the detector, and these are the ends. And the collision occurred right there, and what came out of it are these two green things, one here and up there, and those are two photons. So this is the kind of data. There were billions with a B of collisions that were recorded, and many trillions of collisions that weren't recorded, and we had to look for events that had these characteristics. And that's what we did to try and find the Higgs boson. So here is a data plot, and this one's a fairly easy data plot. So this smooth curve that you see here, this smooth curve is the prediction that the standard model says if you took out the Higgs idea. So ev kept everything in the standard model, took out the Higgs idea. If you plotted the mass of something that turned into two photons, and this is just how many there were, you get this nice smooth prediction. Now these black dots are data, and you see it agrees really, really well, except right here it doesn't agree very well at all, and then it agrees again. And so zooming in on this, we see the smooth prediction, and so we see a bump. Now this doesn't tell you that we found the Higgs boson. What it tells you is that the standard model without the Higgs boson is wrong. Maybe the Higgs boson is the explanation, 
Maybe it's some other particle, the Bugs Bunny particle. I don't know. What I know is that the standard model without the Higgs is wrong. So this is part of the data that we had. Another one, I told you about the Higgs decaying into two Z particles. Z particles themselves decay very rapidly. And so again, this is another type of collision beam entering here, here, collides there. The Z goes to two particles and then they decay. And what you would expect to see is an electron and an electron, these green things, and a muon and a muon, those red things. So this actually gives you an idea of just the very beginnings of this. You look at these mess, all this god-awful bunch of tracks coming out, and you have to pick out the four tracks you care about, and then from that you have to identify that's a good event, and then pick this event out of billions of events you recorded. I mean, that, that's how hard it was. It was terrible. Now I want to show you a, a nifty little picture here. Again, this is a data plot. But, so this is the mass of the thing that made electrons and muons. The blue curve here that you see, this is the prediction of the standard model without the Higgs boson. And the black dots are the data. And you see it goes up. That's nice. Here, it agrees pretty well. That one's a little high, but it's got big error bars. And then you have here. So this red curve is the prediction of Higgs theory. And it does agree better with the data because these two guys are above the blue. But I also want to draw your attention. This is the number of events. So this is one event. That's two events. So the blue prediction was there was one. So there's one extra. There's a couple extra here. If you add up all of the amount above that blue curve, there were 10 collisions. We recorded billions with a B of events. And 10 of them had the right property to be a Higgs boson. So you should be forgiven if you looked at it and said, why should I believe that? I mean, there's this stupid bump here, but there, maybe there's a bump there. You gotta be kidding me. Why would there be this incredible press across the whole world over a data plot looks like that? If you got a plot like that and you showed it to your professor, they might say, well, go back and work on it some more. Um, so why is that? Because this is not the only measurement. There were many measurements. And this kind of gives you a sense of how it went. Remember, there are the two experiments. There's ATLAS and there's CMS. And we took data for two years, 2011 and 2012. And each one of these bubbles is a way in which the Higgs boson can decay. Bottom quarks, Z particles, photons, W particles, tau particles. And so all of the experiments, both experiments and in both years, told the same story. ATLAS only measured two ways in 2012. But there were 17 measurements, and each one of these measurements had different ways of looking at it. So there really were more like 50 or 80 different independent measurements, and they all told the same story. So that is why there was the noise. So you could ask yourself, was the Higgs boson found at the LHC? And as of what I've told you thus far, I can't answer that question. What I can tell you is that a new particle, a new boson, was found. That's true. Was it the Higgs boson? Well, maybe. You've got to prove that it was the Higgs boson. And so, so what's the deal? Well, here's what the deal is. Now, remember, I told you that the Higgs field was a prediction from 1964, and there were explicit predictions. So there was the decay probabilities here. The Higgs boson is predicted to have no electrical charge. It's predicted to have a spin that's like a little quantum mechanical thing, that it has zero spin. And it was also predicted that there was nothing inside it. So you have to prove all of those things are true. Because if any one of those is false, it's not the Higgs boson, it's something else. So what did we know in July of 2012? Well, in July of 2012, we had tested these decays. We hadn't tested this one. We hadn't tested this one. But we had tested many of them. We had proved that the particle didn't have any electrical charge, which is why I have a check. We weren't sure if the spin was zero. It might have been, but it might have been two. We couldn't tell, so that's why it's a question mark. And whether or not there was anything inside it, we weren't able to test that. So the way I like to, to think of this is if we had found a fruit, we would be able to say that it smelled like an apple and it tasted like an apple, but we hadn't touched it uh, listen to it, or whatever the other one is, um, the, the, of all the senses. So we say it's consistent with being a Higgs boson. 
but we have to test the other things to prove it. So here's a little bit more data, and this looks a little awful, but trust me, it's not as bad as it looks like. Here is Atlas, and here is CMS, and this is the July 2012 data. Now I want to draw, you know, guide you through it. Let's pretend that the Higgs field doesn't exist at all, and that, um, that the measurement is perfect. Under that case, we would expect to see measurements on the left-hand line. Now, if the Higgs boson exists, and again, we make perfect measurements, which is never possible, we would expect to see the data on the right-hand line. So, left-hand no, right-hand yes. And furthermore, these little error bars. We have a circle and we have a line. What that line means is there's a 70% chance that the answer is inside there. So this is our best guess, but it can be anywhere in here at 70%, which does mean there's a 30% chance that it could be out here somewhere. So with that in mind, we can go back to that line. And so let's look at some of the awful ones. For instance, this one right here. This dot is on the yellow line, which says that this looked like there was no Higgs boson. But also, the error bars were really huge. The chances that there's a 70% chance that it's in here somewhere, <coughs> which means it could be here, which is awfully close to that. And remember, that 70% means there's a 30% chance it's outside. So it could be over here somewhere with a small probability. So this has a big error bar, so you shouldn't really believe it so much. These guys, well, these are equally likely to be no Higgs boson or Higgs boson, but they have huge uncertainties. The answer could be even up here, which is ridiculous. So those don't carry much weight. So what you need to do is you need to look at the ones with the smaller errors, and they tend to favor the right-hand side. Over here, the ones with the smaller errors tend to favor the right-hand side, and the ones with the bigger errors are all over the place. So it, this really is the data of 2012. And so with this kind of data, there was this big media thing. There it was. I mean, it was all over the place, CNN, um, in uh, Russia, everywhere you could think of. A billion people saw television footage about CERN. This was crazy. Particle physics never gets that kind of uh, mileage. A thousand TV stations, over 5,000 broadcasts. This was a huge deal. You couldn't get away from it. Um, media coverage, you could see it you know, everywhere. The New Scientist, uh, you know, various different languages, take your pick. Um, 17,000 news articles, 100 countries, 7,000 articles use text from CMS and some used from the other experiment too, but they tended to be the same one. And if you cared, you could look and see, you know, Australia was big, USA was big, it was everywhere, it was amazing. Um, I mean, really, the world got into it. I mean, uh, MC Hammer down here, three point million uh, followers of him, and he's saying, you know, how great it was that they found the Higgs boson. Will I am, you know, happy 4th of July to Americans, and happy God Particle Day to science enthusiasts. I mean, it was cool, it was really, uh, uh, it was fun to be part of that. So, but that was like, so 15 months ago. What's new since July of 2012? Well, there have been more measurements. Um, we can measure the, uh, the pr production and decay more precisely. We now have measurements of the spin and we have the measurements of parity. So what the heck is parity? I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so, this is just uh, CMS measurements, but Atlas gives you the same thing. This is the data you already saw, where you saw the small error bars tended to be on the right-hand side, and the big error bars tended to be wherever. Now, here are many more predictions. Don't care what these are, but these are various ways in which that you can make Higgs bosons. And you see all the small <coughs> error bars tend to be on this side, and the big error bars, they're more over the place. In fact, you even get one that's even below not seeing it all, but has huge error bars. So, these smaller error bars clustering around the right-hand side makes it even more likely that what we saw in July of 2012 was real. We have also measured the spin. So how do you measure the spin of a particle so small you can't see it? Well, it's kind of neat to get your head around this. So suppose you have a particle that has no spin and you put it in a world where there's nothing around it. Since it's not spinning, there's no direction that's different from any other direction. And so consequently, the particles should decay in all directions with equal probability because nothing says that's an important direction. So you should expect to see decays this way and this way and this way, all with equal probability. Now, if a particle has a spin of two, then there's a direction it's spinning around. Now there's a special direction. And if you have a special direction, 
then that means the particles that come out decay will decay in a preferred way along the spin direction. So all you do is you look at the particles that come out of these things that you think are Higgs and find out what directions do they uh, decay. And that will tell you something about the spin. A spin zero was predicted, a spin two was possible, and what we found in the data was that the particles, the decay particles, came out in all directions equally. So a spin zero thing was confirmed. There's also this thing called parity. So parity, parity just means it's a quantum mechanical thing, it's all horribly complicated, but what it really boils down to is you have your equation, what happens if in your equation you change left with right, forward with backward, up with down? Well that's hard to draw, so I just did left with right here. So you got this little boy, and on the top hand he's got both hands up, and bottom hand he's got one up and one down. So what happens if you just swap left with right, forget the rest of it? Well, if you swap left with right, in this case, this picture looks very much like the original picture. You can see it's not because the tie moved from one side to the other. But you can, it's hard to tell that you made a swap. This is called positive parity. In this case, it's very different. Here, it's very clear that left and right have been swapped. This is called negative parity. And that's basically the gist of parity. And you study how that happens in the decays. So, the spin and parity, the Higgs boson was predicted back in 1964 to have zero spin and have positive parity. And so we tested over the course of the last umpteen years, um, uh, zero positive parity, zero negative parity, spin of two, positive and negative, spin of one, positive and negative. And what we found is the thing that we found has a spin of zero and a positive parity. It looks like a blood type. It's an O positive part. The Higgs boson is an O positive particle. So, the discovered particle has the same spin and parity as the Higgs boson. So now we have measured more carefully in better detail that the um, Higgs boson has the right decay modes and we've decay seen that it has the right spin and parity. So scientists are pretty willing to conclude now that we have found a Higgs boson. Now you might have just noticed that I said a Higgs boson as opposed to the Higgs boson. The standard model, this is the theory that works beautifully, predicts that there is one and only one Higgs boson. However, there are other theories, an extended theory, one called supersymmetry, it also predicts a Higgs boson. But it predicts five Higgs bosons. So, we've only found one. So does that mean that we've ruled this one out because we would have to expect five? And the answer is no, because it's possible that these other four have a mass higher than we can measure. And so it's really, really hard for us to say that this is what we found. We found one particle that had the same properties as predicted by the Higgs boson, or Higgs theory, but it could be the case where this particle has the same properties as the Higgs theory, and there are some other ones that we haven't found yet. So that's why scientists still, still say that we found a Higgs boson and not the Higgs boson. However, people are starting to get warm up to the idea that maybe we found the Higgs boson. So let's just pretend, just pretend that we found the Higgs boson and what consequence does it have? It turns out, this is kind of a bizarre thing, if we found the Higgs boson it has a consequence on the fate of the universe. And what is that consequence? Well to do that, to tell you about that I have to define some terms. Stable, unstable, and metastable. So the, you guys have all played billiards. A stable situation is you take the pool cue and you put it on the table. That pool cue is going to sit there forever. It's not going to go anywhere. That's stable. If you take the pool cue and you balance it, this is too short to balance, that's unstable. This guy is going to drop the pool cue eventually. This is an unstable situation. That's a stable situation. A metastable situation is like a, uh, a bar stool. Now the bar stool <coughs> will stand there for a very, very long time, but it's more stable if you flip it on its side. Someday some drunk is going to knock into this and the bar stool is going to fall on its side. So metastable means it'll stay there for a long time, but there's a more stable way for it to be. Now if that's true, you can take those ideas and deal with this Higgs thing. So this is a colorful plot. On the bottom is the Higgs uh, mass, and the Higgs mass we found was 125, and this is the top quark mass. And the top quark mass turns out to be about 172. So if the, we had a, a, a Higgs mass of 100 and a top quark mass of 50, that says that the universe is stable. The universe isn't going anywhere. 
if we had a Higgs mass of 100 and a top quark mass of 200, the universe is unstable. We shouldn't even be here. And metastable means the universe will be here for a while, but maybe it will change eventually. So where are the current measurements putting it? Well, right there in this yellow region, right on the edge of the green region. So this is the, where the Higgs is. It's 125. The uh, top is 170. And this is sort of the box of where it could be right there. So if that's true, we've measured things properly, that says the universe is metastable. Now what does it mean to have a universe metastable? That means the laws of physics that we know, the law of physics that make gravity, that holds atom together, the electric forces that we're familiar with, they all have rules. However, that's not the place the universe wants to be. There's some other configuration where maybe gravity <coughs> doesn't exist or the electric field doesn't exist. Something doesn't exist. So if the universe is metastable, well, here's a picture of the universe. What this means is that sometime in the future of the universe, someplace in the universe, the laws of physics will change. And they won't change in a good way because what will happen is if the, there's this little bubble here where the laws of physics change from the metastable state to the stable state, what will happen is that bubble will cross the universe change all the rules, stars won't exist, atoms won't exist, you won't exist, it'll be bad. And you won't even see it coming because that bubble will cross the universe at the speed of light. Now I want to emphasize, it's not that finding the Higgs boson makes this true, it's simply that if those numbers are the real numbers of the universe, this can happen. Now you shouldn't get all nervous about it, this is not like it's going to happen tomorrow, you still have to take the final for you know, the class that you're taking right now. Um, the prediction is if this happens, it won't happen long after the life of the universe. So billions of years, the sun will be burned out and so forth, so that's fine. But if the measurements we've made so far are true and our theory is correct, the universe is metastable and one day everything will be wiped out, which is kind of cool. All right, so there's only a little bit more to talk about here. Um, I've told you a little bit about the tension or maybe not, I didn't tell you too much, but there is a little tension between the two experiments. I mean, everybody wants to be the one that makes the discovery. Atlas and CMS are both going at this really hard, amazing people, very bright. 3,000 scientists on each experiment, they're all working very hard. Each of them wanted to find the Higgs boson, and you see that there's evidence that we found the Higgs boson, but the evidence is not completely perfect. There is, however, one unambiguous case where CMS can say that they have observed the Higgs. And there it is. We did find Higgs, so, and there's no such similar picture at Atlas. I'm just saying, you know, I'm not being catty or nothing, but you know, we found them first. All right, so what's the future? The LHC ran through 2012, uh, December of 2012. We turned on again for a month and a half or so uh, in the beginning of this year to run those lead ions and so forth. <coughs> So now we're shut down. We're undergoing refurbishment, repair, upgrade, making everything hunky and dory. In late 2014, so maybe 14 months from now, the idea is to resume operations. We will turn on and we start shaking down the experiments. That'll take a while. The plan is early of 2015, April maybe or something, we will resume operations, this time taking data. Um, not worrying about what the energy numbers mean, we are currently running at eight trillion electron volts, so that's a unit of energy. When we turn on in 2015, we'll be running at 13 or 14 TeV, so almost double the energy that we've been running so far. More energy, more beam, more everything. It's going to be utterly, incredibly awesome. So you might want to ask, and people always ask, well, man, like, what are you going to find when you run there? And well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we could, these are the things we're looking for. Supersymmetry, hidden valleys, extra dimensions, compositeness, <coughs> Z primes, and so forth and so forth. What we hope, of course, is that we won't find any of that, but we'll find something totally unexpected. Now, it's really a dumb question. It, a dumb question to ask, what are you going to find? I mean, this is, after all, a discovery machine. I mean, Albert Einstein actually said it very best, what, you know, best when he said, if I knew what I was doing, it wouldn't be called research, now would it? So I don't know what we're going to find. Those are the things we're looking for. And so that's most of the talk I want to tell you about the Higgs field, but I do want to draw your attention to something that you already know. And what you know is fall is coming. The leaves are turning. October is right around the corner. 
So why am I telling you about October? Well, it turns out October is a very interesting time for all physicists. And it's always the beginning of October because a very special phone call ca happens. For instance, this year on October 8th at 4.45 Chicago time, a phone call will go out. And I'm not sure who's going to answer that phone call. It probably will not be me. I hope it is, but it probably will not be. It might be this old chap here answering the phone because on that day at that time is when the phone call comes from the Swedish Academy of Sciences giving out a Nobel Prize. Now, I don't know if this year will go to Peter Higgs. Um, I do know that a couple of things. I know that the data is as stable and as good as it's going to be in a long time. I know that Peter Higgs invented the Higgs field in 1964, 50 years ago. I met Peter Higgs. This is about uh, five weeks ago. We were in Stockholm together. And um, there he is. And he's getting on in age. He's 80 years old. He's puttering around. He's still in good health. But the Nobel Prize can't go to you posthumously. You've got to be alive to get it. So I have no inside information. Probably it could be wrong. I am not a member of the Swedish Academy of Sciences, but I think there's a pretty good chance that this year's Nobel will go to Peter Higgs, and I certainly hope it does. And with all that, we're done. Thanks. And for those of you that are on Facebook and want to learn about physics and gossip and whatnot, um, you can follow me there. And uh, you'll hear about all sorts of good gossip from me before you'd hear it in the news. So let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. Okay.